This is your last chance. After this, there is no going back. You take the blue pill. The story ends and you believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So when we last talked about FS logics, we focused only on our user profiles. And that's because in WBD, generally speaking, that's all you really need. Everything is in that profile, including all that office data. However, there are several use cases where it makes sense that we bring back the... Bring... Come on. Okay, the office profile. So we're gonna dig into that today, as well as several other advanced topics in FS Logics. So what exactly is an office profile and how is it different than our user profiles? Well, a user profile has important data in it. This could be documents, this could be configurations. It's persistent data that we need to travel with us from machine to machine as we're moving around our WVD environment. The office profile, on the other hand, is a cache, which means that it's only a local copy of real data that exists somewhere else. However, it can still come in handy for performance optimization or controlling the size of your user profiles. So since the office profile is a cache, what are we caching? Well, this is completely configurable by you, but it can include things like OneDrive, OneNote, Outlook, SharePoint, Skype, and Teams. And it can all be configured through your group policies or your setup scripts, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So if you're going to use both of these profiles for a single user, the question is, where should you store it? You see, we have two different kinds of data, largely persistent data in our user profile and cache data, which is gonna have a lot of reads, writes, adds, and deletes in our Office profile. So the amount of IOPS required for Office may be quite a bit higher than for your user profile. Just think about it. How many times do you change your background wallpaper? Or do you create a new Word file on your desktop or in your My Documents folder? Even if you do that a whole lot, you're not doing it near as much as OneDrive would be syncing, let's say, a whole folder onto your computer or Outlook caching six months worth of email. So part of the answer to this question is also going to be how many users are you supporting? How much storage does it take up? And how many file shares do you have? Again, keeping in mind the best practice principle of one file share to one host pool. And that can get into a area of concurrent connections. More about that in a minute. Now, like we covered in our last video on FS Logics, our user profiles need to have a backup HA and DR. But some good news here in your office profiles, you don't need any of that stuff. Now, the reason why this is the case is because this is cache data. The real info lives up in the cloud somewhere else in one of the office servers. You just have a local copy. So if the worst thing happens and your office profile is completely wiped out, no big deal. You're just going to recache that stuff from the office server, which you're sitting right next to anyway. So we don't need to back it up. But depending on how you configure things and your particular requirements for HA or DR, you may want to have those file shares aligned with how you're doing your user profiles just to make management a little bit easier. And so my neophyte, if you think that you want to have the office profiles in your environment, the first question that we need to ask is, in which host pool scenario should you use it? The pooled host pool is where we have multiple desktop instances, but this is where Windows 10 multi-session comes in. And that's your typical hero solution for people just getting started with WVD. The next kind would be the remote application host pools. Now this is kind of like a pooled pool in that it is Windows 10 multi-session, but you don't get the full desktop experience. This is remote application only. So you may or may not actually need an office profile or a profile at all. And that really comes down to the applications that you're hosting. More about that in a minute. Then we have the personal host pool. Now a personal host pool is where you have one user to one virtual machine. That's their personal computer. Just as if you would have given them their own laptop, now they just get their own instance of WVD. But specifically thinking about FS Logics and personal desktops, this really isn't the situation that I normally recommend using it. 
because that is that person's only computer. The point of FS Logics is that my profile can be on any computer, and so all my data and configuration settings all go with me no matter where it is I end up. In personal, that's the only desktop I'm going to be using, so not really a place for FS Logics. But what if you're using a personal host pool and remote applications. Now things start to get a little tricky. There are two kinds of applications, those with configurations and personalizations and those without them. So if you're using a web browser like Microsoft Edge, this could be just used as a installed default web browser. What you see is what you get. That's it. No profile necessary. You can even configure it with something like group policy to have those configurations centrally managed and controlled how you want it to be. Again, no profile necessary because everything is handled centrally. This is different than when you open an application like VS Code. You can certainly run it without a profile and take all the defaults, but when you want to add any customizations for yourself, those get stored inside a configuration file located at that path. That means each person needs their own settings.json file, and hence everyone needs their own profile. But going down the rabbit hole a little more, Sometimes you end up with concurrent connections. If you want to master the Azure cloud, you can start right now by clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss anything. Now there's a lot to go over here in concurrent connections, so stick with me. Because the problem in any of these concurrent configuration settings is that your users may not understand what it is that's going on and may have different expectations than the experience that they're actually being given. There are three basic types of connection that you can make with FS Logics to your profiles, whether that's user or office. The first one is a single connection. One VHD for your profile to one session host. That's the default behavior and the one, quite honestly, that's most easily managed. The second kind of connection is where you have multiple connections to the VHD from one Windows machine. And the third type is where I have my VHD mounted to two different session hosts at the same time. Now, the way that we get all this magic to happen is through what's called a differencing disk. And to understand that, let me explain the modes of connections. The first mode is mode zero. Basically, no differencing disk is involved because you're in that default connection state of one VM to one session connection. And that's the one I most generally recommend, especially if you're new to FS Logics and WVD. But from here on, there be dragons. In mode one, we take your VHD or VHDX file, whichever one you're using, should be VHDX, and you're connecting that to your session host. We will also create in storage in the same location an rw.vhdx file, and that is your read-write differencing disk. Because when we mount that VHD or VHDX to our session host, the disk is locked, meaning that the session between the VM and the disk can only be written to from that one place, that one location with that one ID. The differencing disk of read-write gives us the option to write to the original profile and write to the read-write differencing disk. So you can have two different connections to the same VHD from the same session host. The next mode is very similar and that's mode two. Instead of a read-write version of that differencing disk, you get a read-only version. This could be good in that VS Code scenario where I don't need to necessarily make changes to my settings.json file, but I do need to be able to read it so I get the experience I want. And the grandpappy of them all is mode three. This is where we have a read-write configuration, but will fall back on a read-only configuration. And the way that that works is a check will be made. Does the rw.vhdx file exist? If not, then take on the read-write role. But if it does, take on the read-only role. Now our office profiles are configured exactly as our user profiles are, and that's using the group policy management console. So I'm protecting here several different applications like Outlook, Teams, OneNote and SharePoint, but whatever works for you. Now, when you set up the Office container and have a user log in, you're gonna get two different virtual hard drives mounted to the system, as you can see here in our Disk Configuration Manager. You can set the size in megabytes for your virtual hard drive, just like you could in the user profile. I would make this disk over-provisioned in size while being dynamic, 
That way you have less need of doing actual maintenance on the virtual hard drive. Now, when your user is logged in, if you go to see users, then you will see all of your user profile folders and a FS Logics user will have two of them. You can see here we have Black Widow and local underscore Black Widow. What's the difference? The Black Widow folder would relate to your user profile data. That's your typical stuff like your desktop documents, pictures, app data, etc. The local underscore Black Widow file has to do with all of that stuff that is not really in your profile, but it has to be present on the local system when you're logged in. And this also comes in with exclusions and redirections. More about that in a minute. Now, if I flip over to my FSLogic share where my virtual hard drives actually exist, and I go into the Black Widow folder, you can see I've got an ODFC for my office container, a user profile, and then I also have a lock file and a metadata file. The lock is there, as I mentioned earlier, because I'm logged in and can only be written to within my particular session. So let's go back to GPMC for a minute, and you'll see the third one that I have enabled is to provide a redirect XML file to customize redirections. This is where I can take things that would generally be allowed and say, I don't want them to be in there, redirect them to that local underscore file so that I don't actually keep them in my profile taking up space. And I'll show you how to implement this with Teams, which is another big example. Teams takes up generally about five gigabytes worth of cache data that you really just don't need in your profile. So I'll show you that in a moment. So back in the profile containers folder, I'm going to enable concurrency. To do that, we have to turn on the feature of profile type, and then we can set that to whichever level of concurrency we want. I'm gonna set it here for mode three, which is read, write, and read only. And then I'll go to the Office 365 container, and I wanna set the same thing here, called VHD access type. So let me log off my Black Widow user and then log back in. And I'll go back into my FS Logic share. And now things look a whole lot different. Starting at the top, I've got my equivalent of my read write disk for my office profile, then the office profile itself, my user profile, and then the associated lock and metadata file, and then the read write file with its lock and metadata. One final word on concurrency, and that is over here in the FSLogix documentation, you can see a very clear warning that OneDrive is not supported in any kind of concurrent configuration at all under any circumstances. Now you can still do concurrent connections by using exclusions. And since the more common use case for doing exclusions is Teams, let me show you that real quick. So here's my FS Logix share, and in the share at the bottom, you can see that I've got a redirections.xml file. So the important line here is the exclude block, and we have listed the cache folder for Teams, which means we won't be putting that in our profile, but instead we'll put that in the local underscore folder. You just need this file to be present here and back in our group policy in that redirect XML customization location, you just put in the path to the file share, not the file itself, just the file share, just save it, update your group policies across your machines, and that will exclude Teams cache data from your profile, saving you about five gigabytes per user. So this has been a very long trip down the rabbit hole. And so I've just got one last thing before you go. If you click over here on the top, you'll get a little pop out and I've got a poll over there for some suggestions for an, the next video on the Azure Academy. So go ahead and vote for me so I know what it is you wanna see next. And I'll probably put out a poll on social media as well. So keep your eye on my Twitter handle at MS Azure Academy, or if you're following me on LinkedIn, it'll be there as well. And if you've enjoyed our content, please subscribe, click like, comment, share, all that good stuff, and comment down below on any questions you have or suggestions for new videos. And I've got linked down here at the bottom the previous video on FS Logics. In case you missed that, you can go check that out. And over there at the top is our latest video on the Azure Academy. And we'll see you next week. Happy learning.